<clears throat> All right, gang, we're going to be talking uh, about the, the, the brain right now, kind of give you a little bit of an uh, introduction or at least to the brain, parts of the brain. And um, I have a little video for you to see and also one on YouTube that is very cool uh, with the split brain operation. This kind of gives you an idea of, uh, again, how the brain is uh, centered in your uh, skull. And um, so that is the part that we're going to talk about now. So here we go. So we take a look at uh, the different parts of the brain. You take a, a focus on the occipital lobe, which is the back of the brain. And this is the part where vision actually occurs. <clears throat> the eyes will pick up information and pick up light and stuff, stuff like that. <clears throat> but it sends it all the way back to the occipital lobe. If you've ever seen uh, Jordy in Star Trek, uh, Next Generation, he's the one with the visor. He's blind, but they're actually he has those visors act as the eyes collecting information, <clears throat> and then they're able to send it back to the occipital lobe so he can process it. The temporal lobe, of course, over the ears for the hearing, and then you have um, you know uh, motor skills up on top. And um, so we'll get the those are basic areas of the brain. <clears throat> if we take a look at the forebrain, it's divided into two areas. It's the inner structures includes the thalamus, hypothalamus, limbic system. The hypothalamus is the part of the brain that basically takes care of hunger, uh, thirst, your basic uh, needs. From there, then you have the outer layer, cerebral cortex. And uh, the corticalization is um, something that you want to think about when uh, the more wrinkles you have on your brain, that's the corticalization, then the, sm the smarter that you are. And so if you take a look at other animals, uh, they, they'll be a lot more smooth compared to the human brain. But if you see a kid or a, a baby's brain that has fetal alcohol syndrome, then they don't have that um, <clears throat> corticalization of the wrinkles. Then you have the <clears throat> two hemispheres of the brain, the right and the left hemispheres. And the right brain controls the left side of the body. Left brain controls the right side. So if you're moving your right hand, as I am now, you can't see me, but I'm doing that, then my left side of my brain is working. If you move your left hand, your right side. So if you had a stroke, somebody had a stroke, and their whole right side was paralyzed, where did they have the stroke at? Yep, left side of the brain, because the left side controls the right side of the body. So that uh, gives you an idea of where that is. Now let me show you this video clip here of the ways that we try to find um, find out how what's going on in the brain as I said before psychology itself in the very beginning is uh, um, a soft science we really didn't have a lot of things to be able to measure the mind or what's going on in the brain now with technology and these are you know, kind of a little bit of history from the history of um, of brain research kind of give you gives you an idea of what direction that we're going now. So take a look see. The first attempts to visualize brain function began with the electroencephalogram or EEG. In an EEG, tracings of electrical impulses from the surface of the head can reveal gross functional changes associated with seizures as seen here and sometimes with tumors, strokes, infections, or other injuries. By applying computer analysis to EEG technology, investigators can now obtain color-coded pictures of electrical activity on the surface of the head. In this sequence of computerized EEG maps, electrical activity emanating from the dark blue point at left reveals an epileptic seizure beginning in the front of the brain. With this technique, Scientists hope to learn more about altered brain function in people with schizophrenia, multiple personality disorder, manic depressive illness, borderline personality disorder, Parkinson's disease, and epilepsy. So that can give you an idea of um, how we use the EEGs now, but now take a look at uh, a really cool vi uh, video on YouTube that talks about the corpus callosum and how it's severed. The corpus callosum is the part of the brain that actually connects the two hemispheres. So without the corpus callosum, the two hemispheres won't be able to communicate with each other. And uh, <clears throat> this uh, gentleman here has uh, had his uh, corpus callosum cut because he had such severe epileptic seizures that that was like the last ditch medicine wasn't working for him. So uh, take a look-see and tell me what you think.
We began our journey into the human brain here on the campus of Dartmouth College in New Hampshire. I come to meet one of the world's leading brain scientists, Mike Desaniga, and a man he's worked with for over a decade. A man with two brains. You've been working a long time with Dr. Gazaniga? 14 or 15 years. Uh, just, it doesn't seem like that. Really, does it? <laughs> well, yeah. The collaboration began when Joe had surgery. And you had this procedure to uh, uh, to correct a, a, an epileptic problem, yes. is that right? Try to stop the seizures. I was having seizures like every day or so, or sometimes two or three a day. To control Joe's epileptic seizures, a surgeon severed the connection between the two halves of his brain. Cutting the corpus callosum like this prevented the spread of the electric storms that caused the seizures. But it also prevented the left and right halves of his brain from communicating with each other. In the years since the operation, Joe's epilepsy has been under control. He now earns a living at an egg farm. And in his everyday life, he's largely unaffected by the fact that his left and his right brains work independently. Do you feel any different when you think about something than you did any differently from the way you felt before the, the procedure? It's just better back our brain, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> that's something everybody could use. <laughs> I found out how true that was right away when I was asked to draw a different shape with each hand. In a brain like mine, roughly speaking normal, at least all in one piece, the left half of my brain controls the right side of my body, while the right brain controls the left side. Oh, no. But because the two halves are connected, nothing wrong with that. Getting each hand to work independently isn't easy. Well, we're seeing that the fact that uh, your Allen's hemispheres are connected and that the uh, motor messages from one are confusing the motor messages of the other. I was just drawing an upside-down duck. <laughs> But when Joe is given the same task, his two hands operate as if controlled by two separate brains. What's happening is that each half of Joe's brain is given a separate instruction. He's asked to fix his eyes on the cross in the center of the screen. Anything flashed to the right of the cross goes only to his left hemisphere. Things to the left go to his right hemisphere. Because the two don't communicate, each hand does only what its half of the brain sees. Wow. <laughs> it's really like two different people doing the same. That's right. Same that's, right. that's the idea. Okay, Joe, uh, I want you to keep your hands up. In an experiment that's now a classic in brain research, Mike Gazaniga, over 30 years ago, used a similar setup to find out if the two halves of the brain are specialized to do different things. Shit. Joe is being flashed a word only to one half of his brain. Words flashed to the right Stolen. are seen only by his left brain. And Joe can report seeing those words just fine. Yeah. Good. But when a word is flashed to his right brain, that well. You can see that. Okay. So I'm going to ask you. But now watch what happens. To draw that with your left hand. Why don't you try drawing another picture of it over here? That'll help you. All full. Oh, okay. Sure. <laughs> it's almost as though somebody has given him a secret communication. That's right. Now he knows that, that it's a telephone. But up until then, he was blind to it. Exactly. When Gazaniga first did this experiment, it instantly proved that the ability to speak resides almost exclusively in the left hemisphere. Not until he sees what his right brain is drawing is Joe able to name it. He said church, you know, after looking at the picture. But he had to figure out about as long as we did. That's really interesting. It's a, it's a, it's a picture here of somebody communicating almost with another person. The communication is not occurring inside the head. It's occurring out on the piece of paper. Yeah. So far, Joe has been seeing only one word. Yeah, Things get even stranger yeah. when he splashed two words, each to only one half of his brain. The right hemisphere saw a toad. Yeah. And so his left hand draws a toad. So there's the toad. Oh, it's a toad. Right. And this time, I was able to guess what was coming. Now, we'll put a little three-legged stool in there later. Or what? 
Joe's speaking left brain saw a stool. Saying the word lets the hand that's controlled by his right brain in on the secret. That's great. That's really interesting. And if he had seen that with, with the corpus callosum intact, he would have drawn a toadstool. Right. Right. Yeah. Not a toad and a stool. Right, exactly the point. I've been doing this for 35 years. Yeah. And, and, and it, it, it gets it, me every time. Yeah, yeah. It, it must. It must. This time, instead of naming the word, I want you to point to the word. Again, Joe sees two words simultaneously. Bell goes to his non-speaking right brain. Music to his speaking left brain. When asked to point to a picture of what he saw, he chooses Bell. But when asked why... Yeah, why did you pick that one? Music. Music. And when asked to explain... It was music and Bell, and it was a few minutes ago, the last time I heard any news, it was coming from the Bells out here. Uh-huh. Banging away. So the, the Bells yeah. outside here? So... You couldn't have answered me. What's extraordinary is that Joe's speaking left brain concocts a plausible story of why he pointed the bell, even when some of the other pictures more obviously represent music. Gazzaniga believes this determination to find cause and effect, this desire to explain, is the left hemisphere's most marvelous property. One of the unique things of the human brain is this need to interpret why two events occur. What was the antecedent of this? What caused this? Mm -hmm. And if you can imagine that a, that a species like us that has that little chip in its brain that asks those questions is going to survive rather well because it's going to figure out more about the nature of the world than a, than a species that doesn't have that. Okay, Joe, uh, I want you to keep your hands But as I was about to discover, the right brain has a very useful survival skill all its own. What do you yeah. think will happen here? So for you, we're doing a live experiment. Never done it before. The experiment involves the 16th century Italian painter Archimbaldo, who made faces out of fruit, flowers, meat, even books. From other research, there's reason to believe that the ability to recognize faces is located exclusively in the right hemisphere. So Mike wondered if Archimbaldo's paintings would look different to each of Joe's two brains. So will his left hemisphere say, I saw a potato, I didn't see a face. And will his right hemisphere say, I saw the face, and not comment on the fact that it was made out of a potato. You're going to see a figure followed by a choice of two words. <laughs> if this works, it'll be terrific, but we'll see. So here it is, live. <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. right, the first painting goes to the right hemisphere. And Joe points okay, to face. The next painting goes to his left brain. And this time he points to fruits. Mike seemed pleased. Are you having a moment? <laughs> this is too good. Again to the right brain. And Joe sees it as a face. Went down. But to the left brain. Face made out of a book. Are you happy with what you're doing? It's unbelievable. He's doing it. You see that? He, it's good to go so fast. You're shifting from left to right so fast. I can't keep up with you. You're when, used to looking at this. When you show him a face in the right side, the left hemisphere, yeah. he's focusing in on the elements that made up the face. Yeah. Now, when you show him the exact same picture in the left field, the right hemisphere, he's focusing on the face and not the elements. And not the elements. If you came down from another planet, and you saw faces and vegetables, you might not think there was much of a difference among them, but the brain seems to be made up in a certain way to say faces are very different from other objects. That's right. And one side of the brain specializes in faces. Right? Exactly right. Exactly right. It is an adaptation that we have to detect upright faces. It's a very important. You can imagine in an evolutionary time that all of a sudden you have the ability to detect quickly an upright face. You want to read the expression on that face. You mm -hmm. want to know if it's friend or foe. You want to have a set of questions about that face. The right brain might be skilled at recognizing faces, but when it comes to what gives the human mind its power, the ability to reason, to invent, to interpret the world around it, Mike Gazzaniga's 30 years of research has taught him which hemisphere he wouldn't want to be without. The old phrase around our lab is, don't leave home without your left hemisphere. <laughs> <laughs> That's where the action is.
Isn't that fascinating? It's amazing how the brain works <clears throat> and how all these things fall into place together. So if somebody had a, uh, I was thinking, had Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's disease and then uh, a lot of the uh, recognizing of faces, you wonder if it's on the right side that they start to get that, you know, uh, the more of the problem or if they have any kind of head damage or head trauma, then, you know, you got to find to figure out the left side uh, is more so for language and that would affect your language if you had a stroke there. So there are some things for you to think about. I'm going to go ahead and post this. Uh, write down some comments and tell me what you think. Uh, if, this, if you like it, I'll continue to do this. And um, that should be it. Thank you.